This is the new ZV-E1 from Sony, which surprisingly in many ways is like an FX3 for half the price. Let's get undone. Gerald Undone. He's crazy. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone and hey, Macarena. So for disclosure, Sony lent me this camera to make this review. I don't get to keep it. No money changed hands and Sony does not get any input on this video's production or get to preview it before it's posted. This video does have an actual sponsor though and that's Storyblocks. So for the sake of simplifying this review, let me clear up the FX3 comparison I made in the intro. This camera possesses many of the same internals as the A7S 3 and FX3. It's using the same sensor and processor, so you can expect a nearly identical image when it comes to dynamic range and rolling shutter performance. But just to be sure, I tested it, and yes, in 4K24, we're getting the same rolling shutter of 8.7 milliseconds. And using Xyla 21 and Imatest, I measured 14.4 total stops of dynamic range with a medium score of 12.7, which is very similar to the results of the other cameras using this sensor. It features the same dual native ISOs and S-Log3 as the A7S 3 which are ISO 640 and 12800, and the noise performance, color, and overall image quality are basically equal. It's the same sensor. The comparisons of the FX3 go deeper though, because this camera also doesn't have an EVF, and it has most of the features of the FX3's 2.0 firmware, including the separate log shooting tab, the ability to upload user LUTs, the preset LUTs like S709, and the new cleaner display when in video mode. It doesn't have Cine EI mode though, so the log shooting is limited to flexible ISO, and as I mentioned, the base is 640 instead of 800, which is more like the A7S III. It's also aimed more at video. It can still take pictures and has a mode switch that goes to photo, but there's no EVF, no mechanical shutter, and fewer photocentric functions. Oh, and it also has a tally lamp, and the strap eyelets are silent with no jangly triangles. The main differences between this camera and the FX3 are its size, ports, and heat management. This is Sony's smallest full frame camera to date, and because it's a ZV camera, it takes design cues from the previous models in that line, like recycled plastic, the large mic capsule on top, function buttons map for things like product showcase mode or background defocus, and only a single card slot. It does still have 3.5 millimeter microphone and headphone jacks and USB-C port for charging and live streaming, but the HDMI port is a micro type D, which is significantly less robust than the FX3's type A port. Functionally though, the HDMI output performs the same as the last few Sony cameras, same strengths, same quirks, nothing new to report. But the flip out LCD screen has a few new tricks. First, you can now swipe from the sides to bring up some extra buttons on the screen. And if you don't like that feature, you can turn it off in the menu. But now you can also control your exposure and white balance using touch, which is something I've been waiting for Sony to implement for a long time. So I'm happy to see it here and hoping they continue this with future cameras. Now, despite it being small and using recycled materials, it doesn't feel too bad in the hands. I expected to hate the grip, but I actually kind of like how they balanced the small size while still feeling like you have a decent grasp on the camera but the finish is smoother, more plasticky, and a bit slipperier than the more premium models. So overall, the build quality certainly isn't as good as the FX3, but it's definitely my favorite of the ZV lineup. It does still use the FZ100 battery though, which is great, so record times are solid, with the only limitation being heat, because as I mentioned, this camera does not have the same thermal capabilities as the FX3 or even the A7S3. Now, because it only has one SD card slot, it can't record the absolute highest bit rates that the FX3 can, but it can still manage any of the modes you could record to via SD card on those previous cameras, including all intra recording up to 600 megabits per second. Currently, it only comes with 4K60, but they'll be releasing the 4K 120 via firmware. This seems silly to me, as we all know this sensor is capable of 4K 120, so why not release it alongside the camera? I've heard rumors that this could be to sell the 4K 120 as an upgrade in some regions, and if that's the case, I'm pretty disappointed by that decision, but I'll save that scorn until we know what's actually going to happen. Anyway, that means for my testing, I was only able to check the runtime of up to 4K60, which Sony is rating at 30 minutes at 25C, which is 77 Fahrenheit. I tested it in a 22C environment or around 72 Fahrenheit and got one hour and 11 minutes of 4K60 before the camera shut down due to heat. All of these tests, by the way, were with the heat threshold set to high, the screen open and away from the body, and the camera on a tripod. When I increased the ambient temperature to 24C or 75 Fahrenheit, the runtime shortened to 42 minutes before overheating. In 4K24, my results were two hours, 19 minutes at 22C or 72 Fahrenheit, at which point the battery died, but the camera did not overheat. Then I got one hour and 36 minutes at 23C and one hour and 11 minutes at 24C, both because of overheating. So you can see that the camera's runtime quickly tapers off as you increase ambient temperature, which leads me to make a few conclusions and recommendations. This camera will do quite well in an environment of 22C or lower, but is definitely not recommended in hot environments unless you only record short clips. 
I suspect Sony finds this acceptable though, as they're targeting this camera toward vloggers who likely aren't recording hour long takes and are probably recording their 4K60 in very short bursts. But it would be nice if it was capable of performing better in higher ambient temperatures. Oh, it also has a newly upgraded live streaming protocol that allows up to 4K30. So I tested how long I could use that feature before overheating and I got 56 minutes in a 23C, 73F environment. And that wasn't using the simultaneous internal recording option which when enabled would drastically shorten your streaming runtime. And if you're like me, and your first thought was, well, what if I record externally? Will that bypass the heat limits? Sadly, no, similar to live streaming, HDMI output doesn't seem to increase your runtime in any significant way. I only got 36 minutes of 4K60 in a 25C environment when recording exclusively externally. Now, all of these times are significantly increased if you opt for full HD instead of 4K, with 1080p60 tripling the 4K60's rated runtime from 30 minutes to 90 minutes in a 25C environment. And I had no issues live streaming at 1080p60 either. But overall, that's the biggest difference between this and the FX3, that heat management. So if the limited record times aren't an issue for you, consider it an FX3 at a major discount. Now, it does not come with the audio top handle of the FX3, but unlike the previous ZV cameras, this one actually does have the multi-interface hot shoe. So you can plug the digital mics or the K3M XLR module into the shoe on this camera and record up to four channel digital audio. But the built-in microphone is pretty cool too. It's directional now, so you can set it to pick up sounds from in front of the camera, behind the camera, or all around. And it has an intelligent auto switching mode that uses subject detection to determine when to switch to the front capsule based on if your subject has entered the frame and then switches back to omnidirectional when the subject leaves. But the new subject detection features go well beyond just this new microphone and are some of the most interesting aspects of this camera. It's using the new AI processing unit that we saw in the A7R5. In fact, the entire autofocus experience on this camera feels very similar to that A7R5. You've got the same subject selections like human, animals, birds, insects, cars, trains, planes, etc. And the human detection is more than just face and eye and involves recognizing limbs, the back of a torso or head, predicting movement, and so on. The autofocus was incredible on the A7R5, and it's just as incredible here. However, what's new is that this camera is now taking that subject tracking capability and using it to improve the stabilization and add useful functions for the solo shooter. But before we get into all those new functions, let's take a moment to pause and talk about the new stabilization and the improved clear image zoom, since those new functions are built on the improvement of these classic features. So clear image zoom, for those that don't know, is the ability to zoom in digitally while seemingly not losing any quality. In 4K, for example, you can zoom an extra 1.5 times while still keeping a 4K recording and with a final image that's very hard to tell that it's been zoomed in or upscaled. I've always thought it was cool technology, but I never used it in video because it came with significant drawbacks. Primarily, you'd lose your ability to track subjects and lose eye detection and autofocus, which was a big deal for someone who filmed themselves. However, on the ZV-E1, not only does it have a zoom rocker on the front around the shutter button, another similarity to the FX3, but you can map that zoom rocker to use clear image zoom, and when you use clear image zoom on this camera, you don't lose anything. You maintain all of your detection and tracking methods even as you zoom up to 1.5 times in 4K. You can even keep active stabilization on the entire time. This is huge. It basically makes any lens you put on this camera more versatile without giving anything up. The 20mm Prime, for example, now becomes a 20-30mm f1.8 lens for free without losing eye tracking. But that active stabilization I mentioned now has a new mode that uses clear image zoom to stabilize even further. They're calling it dynamic active, and it's basically a more aggressive crop that's possible thanks to clear image zoom because the sensor isn't high enough resolution to support that much of a crop natively. It then uses that extra simulated real estate to significantly reduce shakes in your image. Here's some clips for you to watch of me jogging after Lindsay in the garage, the same test I did with the Panasonic S5 II, and you'll notice that even when enabling active stabilization, the drops from my footsteps are still very visible. However, when we turn on dynamic active, a significant crop is applied, but then the foot drops are almost entirely eliminated. And instead, we get this floaty feel that is the closest I've ever seen a camera look like it was flying on a gimbal. Now, the S5 II did really well in this test too, but because the IBIS was so strong, it suffered from those warpy, wobbly corners. But because the ZV-E1 is using clear image zoom to crop in, the warpiness is cropped away and you're left with probably the best in-camera stabilization I've ever seen. The only drawback is that you won't be able to get as wide because of that extra 30% crop. But since this is a vlogging camera at heart, let's take it outside and put that stabilization, autofocus, and the new mic capsule to the test. Okay, so here we go, we're vlogging. I've got the 20 mil lens on. Uh, I'm shooting with active stabilization, so there's a little bit of a crop there. If I put in dynamic active, it'd be even more of a crop, but 
too much for vlogging with the 20 mil. I'm using the built-in microphone with the, it's facing forward for the capsule and I have the little dead cat that comes included with the camera attached. And there's quite a bit of noise. I'm walking through sort of a, a noisy area with wind and with traffic and stuff like that. There's a some kind of weird pump sound over here. So we'll see how it does for rejection and isolation of my sound or my, my voice there. And I'm using auto pretty much everything. So uh, auto white balance, auto exposure. I do have a variable ND on. So if the color is a little bit different, it's probably because of that. And I'm also using the eye tracking autofocus. So let's evaluate all this, the autofocus, the stabilization and the audio while I tell you about today's sponsor, Storyblocks. So sometimes you don't have the shot you need and there's no way you're gonna be able to go ahead and get it before you run out of time, run out of money, or run out of patience by completely derailing your creative momentum. And that's where Storyblocks comes in. Storyblocks is a stock media platform that boasts a massive library of high quality assets aimed to strengthen your video production. Their subscription model provides predictable costs without any pay per clip licensing. Just pick a plan, pay that fee, and that's it. And you'll enjoy unlimited downloads of HD and 4K video files, images, and motion graphics templates that you can use worry-free for both your personal and commercial projects. And the platform is intuitive and easy to use, and new content is added regularly with a focus on in-demand keywords to deliver up-to-date assets to satisfy your project. And if you're an Adobe Creative Cloud user, you can now access the entire Storyblocks library right in Premiere Pro or After Effects with the use of a clever little plugin, which will really speed up your workflow. If you've never browsed Storyblocks before, I think you'll be truly impressed by just how exhaustive and useful their library is, and I encourage you to learn more about them by using the link in the description below. Now what gets more interesting is that this camera can take that dynamic active stabilization and use the new subject detection algorithms to enable a feature called framing stabilizer, which allows that extra crop to move around intelligently to ensure that the subject stays in the same place throughout the shot. You can choose between keeping them in the center or manually assigning a position. This is particularly handy when you're doing those follow shots or if you're tracking from the side and you're dodging obstacles and struggling to keep the subject where you want them, this feature will keep them framed up nicely for you automatically while stabilizing as well. But you can also use this function to auto frame a subject to give the appearance of camera movement. Essentially imagine that same clear image zoom crop, but rather than be fixed to the center of the screen, it follows you around as you move. Now it's limited to the total width of the sensor obviously because the camera isn't actually moving, but it can give you the illusion that you have a camera operator that's following you to a certain extent and you have a lot of control over it. So you can decide if you want a full body shot, a medium crop, or a tighter shoulders and up crop. You can control the speed of the tracking, how it gets initiated, including the ability to loop the crop so that it moves in and out of the tight and wide angles on a timer. And what's even cooler is that if you have an HDMI recorder connected, you can record two different versions of your shot. For example, you could send a completely uncropped version over HDMI and then record the baked in crops to the SD card. It's definitely an interesting inclusion and something I could see solo creators getting serious use out of. There's also a few other features they've included that I imagine are targeted at beginners. They've added a cinematic vlog mode, which basically just bakes in black letterbox bars into your footage and lets you select from a few preset color grades. It's mostly a gimmick since you're still recording a 16 by nine image, but I guess it could save time if your intention was to put black bars and some cliche grade on your footage, or if you weren't comfortable doing that in post yourself. But to be honest, there's a part of me that hates this feature exists. Does this look cinematic? I sure hope so, because we have it in cinematic vlog mode. Ooh, cinema. Yeah, actually, the colors actually look pretty good, to be honest with you. It doesn't look too bad. These black bars are ridiculous, but the image between them actually looks pretty nice. But is it cinematic? There's also a self timer for video now, which is handy and this cool automatic depth of field thing that only works when you set the camera to intelligent auto but it'll recognize when a second subject enters the frame and will stop down your lens to bring both of you in focus and then compensate with ISO to normalize the exposure. This is incredibly handy for people that switch between one and multiple subjects at different depths, but don't always have the ability to change their camera settings on the fly. And the final feature this camera has that I wanna discuss is focus breathing compensation. Now, if you've watched any of my recent Sony camera reviews, you've likely seen me complain that every new camera is getting focus breathing compensation, but they still haven't added it to their more expensive cameras like the A7S III or A1. And occasionally, you get some Sony apologizers trying to defend this by suggesting that it's because of a limitation in the A7S III sensor or something about the size of the camera, etc. Well, the existence of this ZV-E1 basically disproves any apologizer theory and instead shows a lack of listening and firmware support on Sony's side. 
because this camera is their smallest full frame camera, and it uses the same sensor and processor as the a7S III. So if this camera can have it, I can't see any reason why the a7S III can't receive focus breathing compensation as a firmware upgrade. But it goes beyond that now, because most of the features of this new camera are just software. So sure, maybe we can't do all the AI subject detection stuff because other cameras don't have that AI processing unit. But the a7R5 does. Will it see these features added? It's only a few months old. What about this new clear image zoom? Can we get that added to the a7 IV, a1, a7S III, fx3, etc.? What about the 4K30 webcam improvement or the touch functionality? The list could go on and on. And then there's these strange limitations that have been around since the a7S III, like the inability to record 30 frames per second in H.265, which still persists in this camera, but with no fix or explanation from Sony. Don't get me wrong, I think it's incredible that Sony is able to keep coming up with cool functions and features, and it's even better that they're willing to put all of them into their less expensive bodies. And I really appreciate that they aren't afraid to cannibalize their bigger cameras by loading up the cheaper bodies and letting consumers with smaller budgets enjoy these aspects. But this release system only works if you also have enough resources dedicated to bringing some of those features back to your customers who bought your more expensive bodies. If you don't, you'll risk losing them when you announce your next flagship. Because let's face it, the word flagship has started losing some of its punch when this small, significantly cheaper camera can do more stuff. So this puts me in a weird position because this is a review of this camera, which is actually really cool. It's just that each time I review a new Sony camera, I get annoyed and distracted about what my current, more expensive cameras can't do. But let's try to wrap this video up by just talking about this camera's value proposition. I'd say that if the shortcomings that come from this type of build don't bother you, you're getting an incredible deal. Bearing in mind that it doesn't do nearly as well for heat management, it feels a bit cheaper, and it's limited in ports and card slots compared to the FX3, it's also simultaneously a much more feature-rich version of the FX3 with identical internal hardware plus the AI processing unit for significantly less money. And considering I called the a7S III a technical masterpiece back in 2020, I couldn't possibly give this new camera that does all that and more anything less than a very strong recommendation, provided you're okay with its limitations. But considering those use cases, this camera's excellent rolling shutter performance, the self-filming conveniences, the shockingly good stabilization, and the compact form factor might just make it the best vlogging camera that exists to date. All right, I'm done.